I've seen a lot of change, been through a lot of pain. Some things are not the same as they were a year ago. But all will be okay. I move on each and every day. The past is where it stays. Way back a year ago. I've changed for the better this time. I thought I would never be fine. I strive just to say I'm alright. And for the first time in a long time, I'm alright. I've seen a lot of change, been through a lot of pain. Some things are not the same as they were. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the book study. Tonight we're going to be starting in chapter two. There is a solution. Now, the first half of this chapter is going to cover the problem. You've got to know what the problem is before you can come up with a solution. The second half will talk about the solution. This page right here is going to describe the fellowship. So let's get into it. We have Alcoholics Anonymous. No. Thousands of men and women who were once just as hopeless as Bill. We're going to highlight nearly all have recovered. They have solved the drink problem. We're average Americans, all sections of this country, and many of its occupations are represented as well as many political, economic, social, and religious backgrounds. We're going to highlight this here. We are people who normally would not mix. That's a true big statement there. But there exists among us a fellowship, a friendliness, and an understanding which is indescribably wonderful. Let's highlight this. We are like the passengers of a great liner the moment after rescue from shipwreck, when camaraderie, joyousness, and democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to captain's table. So I got sober in 97, and that movie, The Titanic, came out in 97. So I understood what steerage and captain's table was. Steerage was Leonardo DiCaprio who won a ticket to get on the ship and rode in the bottom of the ship. Captain's table, obviously, is for the rich people. Unlike the feelings of the ship's passengers, however, let's highlight this. Our joy in escape from disaster does not subside as we go in our individual ways. The feeling of having shared in a common peril is one element in the powerful cement which binds us, but that in itself would never have held us together as we are joined now. So that's the first warning here. There's more to it than the fellowship. I look at it as like a two-part epoxy. You've got the one part, which is the fellowship, and then the second part, which is the activator that bonds it together, is the 12 steps. So the fellowship is good. Most people come to the fellowship, but in order to stay, you're going to need to take the steps. That's my belief. Let's highlight this one more sentence here, and then that's going to tie all this together. I put that in parentheses. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. That common solution is the 12 steps. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. I like this. This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. An illness of this sort, I underline them, we have come to believe it an illness. We got that from the doctor's opinion. It involves those about us in a way no other human sickness can. If a person has cancer, all are sorry for him, and no one is hurt or angry. If a person has cancer, all are sorry for him, and no one is angry or hurt. I like the rest of the paragraph. But not so with the alcoholic illness, for with it there goes annihilation of all things worthwhile in life. It engulfs all whose lives touch the sufferers. It brings misunderstanding, fierce resentment, financial insecurity, Disgusted friends and employers, warped lives of blameless children, sad wives and parents. Anyone can increase the list. I wrote down ninth step will fix this. We hope this volume will inform and comfort those who are or who may be affected. There are many. 
highly competent psychiatrists who have dealt with us have found it sometimes impossible to persuade an alcoholic to discuss his situation without reserve. I underline without reserve. All I want to tell you what I want you to hear. I like the rest of this paragraph and the whole next paragraph. Strangely enough, wives, parents, and intimate friends usually find us even more unapproachable than do the <clears throat> than do the psychiatrist and the doctor. They're just tired of our stuff, man. But the ex problem drinker who has found this solution, who is properly armed with facts about himself, they've been through the process, they know what's going on, they know character defects. This person can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours, and until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. That the man who is making the approach has had the same difficulty, underline this, that he has, that he obviously knows what he is talking about, that his whole department shouts at the news prospect that he is a man with a real answer, that he has no attitude of holier than thou, do not talk down to somebody. Nothing whatever except the sincere desire to be helpful. Highlight the rest of the paragraph. There are no fees to pay, no axes to grind, no people to please, no lectures to be endured. These are the conditions we have found most effective. After such an approach, many take up their beds and walk again. Let's underline many take up their beds and walk again. I wrote next to that Matthew chapter 9 verse 6. I just like to put some scripture in there to show what's going on here. You got to remember that these guys were going to the Oxford group, which studied first century Christianity. So I think Bill pulled a lot of his stuff in this book out of some scripture that he was studying. None of us makes a sole vocation of this work, nor do we think its effectiveness would be increased if we did. We feel that, and let's highlight elimination of drinking is but a beginning. A much more important demonstration of our principles lies before us in our respective homes, occupations, and affairs. So we're going to practice these principles in all our affairs. It's more important to take this home and use it at home and on the job and in all of our affairs. All of us spend much of our spare time in the sort of effort which we are going to describe. A few are fortunate enough to be so situated that they can give nearly all their time to the work. Highlight. If we keep on the way we are going, there is little doubt that much good will result, but the surface of the problem would hardly be scratched. Those of us who live in large cities are overcome by the reflection that highlight close by hundreds are dropping into oblivion every day. You can see the epidemic of homelessness. Most of that is drug addiction and alcoholism. Many could recover if they had the opportunity we have enjoyed. How? Then shall we present that which has been so freely given us. I put this paragraph in a parenthesis. We have concluded to publish an anonymous volume setting forth the problem as we see it. We shall bring to the task our combined experience and knowledge. That's the first 100 people who contributed to the book. Underline this should suggest a useful program for anyone concerned with the drinking problem. Of necessity, there will have to be discussion of matters medical, psychiatric, social, and religious. We are aware that these matters are, from their very nature, controversial. Highlight, nothing would please us so much as to write a book which would contain no basis for contention or arguments. We shall do our utmost to achieve that idea. Highlight, most of us sense that a real tolerance of other people's shortcomings and viewpoints and a respect for their opinions or attitudes which make us more useful to others. Keep highlighting the rest of the paragraph. Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. My sponsor had me do one deed a day, one decent thing a day, or good deed, whichever. He had me do one a day for 30 days in a row, told me not to tell anybody. I had to learn some humility as well as trying to help others. And uh, he said, call me when you finish your 30 days. Well, it took about two and a half to three years for me to complete that. 
I get to day 22 and have to start over, day 7 have to start over because I kept forgetting. I found out the principle that he was working on though. You may already have asked yourself why it is that all of us become so very ill from drinking. Doubtless you are curious to discover how and why, highlight in the face of expert opinion to the contrary, we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. If you're an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, what do I have to do? It is the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically. Underline, we shall tell you what we have done. Before going into a detailed discussion, it may be well to summarize some points as we see them. How many times have people said to us, we're going to highlight the rest of the paragraph. I can take it or leave it alone. Why can't he? Why don't you drink like a gentleman or quit? That fellow can't handle his liquor. Why don't you try beer and wine? Lay off the hard stuff. His willpower must be weak. He could stop if he wanted to. She's such a sweet girl. I should think he'd stop for her sake. The doctor told him that if he ever drank again, it would kill him, but there he is, all lit up again. Now, these are commonplace observations on drinkers, which we hear all the time. Highlight back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. We see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different from ours. Okay, we're going to describe three types of drinkers. Number one is the moderate drinkers have very little trouble in giving up liquor entirely. If they have good reason for it, they can take it or leave it alone. Number two, then we have a certain type of hard drinker. He may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him physically and mentally. It may cause him to die a few years before his time. If a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, falling in love, change of environment, or the warning of a doctor becomes operative, this man can also stop or moderate, although he may find it difficult and troublesome and may even need medical attention. This represents that I would have highlighted the whole thing. I just didn't want to run out of highlighter. Number three, but what about the real alcoholic? He may start off as a moderate drinker. He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. Here is the fellow who has been puzzling you, especially in his lack of control. He does absurd, incredible, tragic things while drinking. He is a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He is seldom mildly intoxicated. He is always more or less insanely drunk. His disposition while drinking resembles his normal nature but little. He may be one of the finest fellows in the world, yet let him drink for a day and he frequently becomes disgustingly and even dangerously antisocial. He has a positive genius for getting tight at exactly the wrong moment, particularly when some important decision must be made or engagement kept. He is often perfectly sensible and well-balanced concerning everything except liquor, but in that respect he is incredibly dishonest and selfish. He often possesses special abilities, skills, and aptitudes and has a promising career ahead of him. He uses his gifts to build up a bright outlook for his family and himself and then pulls the structure down on his head by a senseless series of sprees. We can do that being sober as well. He is the fellow who goes to bed so intoxicated he ought to sleep to clock the ground. Yet early next morning... He searches madly for the bottle he misplaced the night before. If he can afford it, he may have liquor concealed all over his house to be certain no one gets his entire supply away from him to throw down the waste pipe. As matters grow worse, he begins to use a combination of high-powered sedative and liquor to quiet his nerves so he can go to work. Then comes the day when he simply cannot make it and gets drunk all over again. Perhaps he goes to a doctor who gives him morphine or sedative with which to taper off. Then he begins to appear at hospitals and sanitariums. This is by no means a comprehensive picture of the true alcoholic as our behavior patterns vary, but this description should identify him roughly. Why does he behave like this? If hundreds of experience have shown him that one drink means another debacle with all its attendant suffering and humiliation, why is it he takes that one drink? Why can't he stay on the water wagon? 
what has become of the common sense and willpower that he still sometimes displays with respect to other matters. So we end our highlighting there. You can see we're highlighted again. Perhaps there never will be a full answer to these questions. Opinions vary considerably as to why the alcoholic reacts differently from normal people. We are not sure why, once a certain point is reached, little can be done for him. We cannot answer the riddle. We know that while the alcoholic keeps away from drink as he may do for months or years, he reacts much like other men. We are equally positive that Underlying once he takes any alcohol, whatever, into his system, something happens, both in the bodily and mental sense. I like the rest of this paragraph, which makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. The experiences of any alcoholic would abundantly confirm this, so we say don't take the first drink and you won't get drunk. Let's keep highlighting. These observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink thereby setting the terrible cycle in motion. Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. So every time I'd come up with a good idea, Paul Connors would ask me, Kenny, where is the problem center? In the mind. If you ask him why he started on that last bender, the chances are he will offer you any one of a hundred alibis. Sometimes these excuses have a certain plausibility and then highlight, but none of them really makes sense in the light of the havoc an alcoholic's drinking bout creates. They sound like the philosophy of the man who, having a headache, beats himself on the head with a hammer so that he may not, so that he cannot feel the ache. If you draw this fallacious reason into the attention of an alcoholic, he will laugh it off or become irritated and refuse to talk. Let's highlight once in a while he may tell the truth. And the truth, strange to say, is usually that he has no more idea why he took the first drink than you have. Some drinkers have excuses with which they are satisfied part of the time. Highlight, but in their hearts they really do not know why they do it. Once this malady has a real hold, they are a baffled lot. Highlight the rest. There is the obsession that somehow, someday, they will beat the game, but they often suspect they are down for the count. We talk about the mental obsession, okay? I say that it is a mental flirtation through which there is only a spiritual release. So whenever I start obsessing on something, we're talking about alcohol here, but whenever I start obsessing on anything, it is still a mental flirtation through which there is only a spiritual release. I need God in order to get out of this. How true this is, few realize. In a vague way, their families and friends sense that these drinkers are abnormal, but everybody hopefully awaits the day when the sufferer will rouse himself from his lethargy and assert his power of will. The tragic truth is that the man be a real alcoholic, the happy day may not arrive. He has lost control. I like the rest of this paragraph. At a certain point in the drinking of every alcoholic, he passes through a state where the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. This tragic situation has already arrived in practically everyone long before it is suspected. Other people already knew that I had an alcohol problem, but I didn't know it. Let's highlight this next paragraph. This is a strong paragraph. It says, the fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. So I think about what I did last week, but I tell myself I won't do that again. So it's not a sufficient force to keep me from doing it again. The almost certain consequences that follow taking even a glass of beer do not crowd into the mind to deter us. I like the rest of this paragraph. If these thoughts occur, they are hazy and readily replaced with the old thread by, uh, threadbare idea that this time we shall handle ourselves like other people. There is a complete failure of the kind of defense that keeps one from putting his hand on a hot stove. Well, I'll tell you, if I ever got the pleasure out of putting my hand on a hot stove that I used to get out of drinking... 
then I would keep putting my hand on a hot stove, so I just don't quite get that. The alcoholic may say to himself in the most casual way, it won't burn me this time, so here's how. Highlight, or perhaps he doesn't think at all. How often have some of us begun to drink in this nonchalant way and after the third or fourth pounded on the bar and said to ourselves, for God's sake, how did I ever get started again? Only to have that thought replaced by, well, I'll stop with the sixth drink. Or, what's the use anyhow? When this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies, let's highlight he has probably placed himself beyond human aid. I put a block around beyond human aid. What they're doing here is they're planting the seed for a higher power. If you've reached this point, then you have probably placed yourself beyond human aid. Getting us ready for the second step. And unless locked up, may die or go permanently insane. These stark and ugly facts have been confirmed by legions of alcoholics throughout history. But for the grace of God, there would have been thousands more convincing demonstrations. We highlight so many want to stop but cannot. I also underline that. So many want to stop but cannot. All right, guys. This is the end of the first half. We're going to go into the second half, which is the solution. We've talked all about the problem in the first half of there is a solution. Next week, we go into the second half. It's going to be the tenth step right here. There is a solution. Let's highlight it. Almost none of us like the searching, self-searching, the leaven of our pride, the confession of shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful consummation. We'll get into that next week. We'll describe it to you, let you know what this is talking about. All right, thanks for joining me tonight. God bless. See you on the next one.